Have fun, be good, play right. Can they depend on you? That and much more. Let's get to it. Let's talk museal moments next. There are a lot of cool things about sports. Making the incredible play, breaking records, winning championships, and being a good sport. Good sportsmanship is one of the most important things you can learn. Sportsmanship is playing fair, being honest, and showing respect. And the best example we know is Stan Musial. Stan the man, one of the greatest baseball players of all time, and an even better person. Stan Musial was a good sport on and off the field. So we created Musial Moments in his honor to describe acts of kindness and selflessness that lift us up at play, at school, at home, or anywhere. Today, we will learn why sportsmanship matters and how to make your own museal moments. Hello, everybody. I'm Solomon Alexander, and I'm the Foundation Director of the St. Louis Sports Commission. For today, I want to thank you for checking out Museal Moments. Museal Moments is named for the greatest cardinal who ever lived, Stan the Man Museal. As you may notice, I'm not at the Sports Commission today, nor am I at your school. COVID has made a serious impact on our community. Having the ability to join you in person is not ideal right now. So coming your way by video is a great way to be safe and still get our message to wherever you may be. I hope everyone is out there protecting themselves and their loved ones. So Stan played over 3,000 games as a Cardinal, more than any other player ever. So what does 3,000 have to do with 2,600? If you're watching this and you went to school, perfect attendance, kindergarten through high school, that means you've gone to school around 2,600 days. Some a little less, some a little more. So whether you play pro baseball or sports at any level, things happen to you. People say things. People like to do things that get on your nerves. If this was a school setting, I would ask how many of you have ever had a teacher get on your nerves? Some would raise their hands, or a coach, or a classmate get on your nerves. And then I would ask my ooh question. How many of you have ever had an administrator, a dean, or a principal get on your nerves? A lot of hands would fly up then. And the last one, a little disclaimer here. You could possibly be in your house watching this with your family right now. You don't have to raise your hand because we all need each other at this time. But how many of you have had your parents get on your nerves? See, somebody out there knows what I'm talking about. Somebody knows what I'm saying. We have people get on our nerves, not because they're mean people, it's because they're human. Humans do things we like, humans do things we don't like. And even in the days of Stan Musial, even when he played, there were people that knew he was one of the best players in baseball. So they said things to get on his nerves. Maybe they knew his wife hadn't been feeling well. Maybe they knew his kids hadn't been doing so hot in school. And they said things to try to get on his nerves, just like people say stuff every day to try to get on your nerves in school. But Stan understood something that we should all understand. It's not what happens to you that matters. It's how you react to it. Have fun, be good, play right. As an example, look at what I'm wearing. This is a gift from my wife from over the holidays. She said, you go out to all these schools and talk to all these kids, and you should wear something nice. This polo is very nice. It's comfortable, lightweight, all the things we like. But here's the thing. My wife's not out here right now, so she won't hear this, and you can't tell her. See, I'm a man of a certain style. And when a man of a certain style wears a big blue polo, he might look like Cookie Monster. And there, I hear you all laughing, but there's nothing I can do about it because if I wore a white shirt, I would look like a gallon of milk. If I wore a purple shirt, I would look like Barney. If this were a red shirt cut in half, I'd probably look like Winnie the Pooh. So whatever you can imagine for yourself, laugh as much as you want because we're gonna have fun today. Musial was the greatest cardinal who ever lived. And it's not just true because this guy who looks like the cookie monster told you so. It's true because to this day, even though he retired in 1963, Stan Musial still holds most of the cardinal records. Most home runs, 475. 
3,630 hits as a Cardinal, 1,815 at home, 1,815 on the road. And that's a lesson for you and I, whether we can play baseball or not. Are you the same person at home as you are away from home? Can your family, your team, community, and your school depend on you to be the same no matter what? If they can, that's awesome. If not, that's something we need to work on. Remember, it's not what happens to you that matters. It's how you react to it. Have fun, be good, play right. See, one of the things I want everyone to get from this program is that Stan wasn't just a great baseball player, but he was a great person. Because 57 years after his retirement, people talked most about how he treated them more so than his records, more so than his numbers. They talked about him. They talked more about Stan the man more than Stan the ball player. But that's not why we named this program after him. His numbers were great. He was a great person but there's a deeper meaning. We named this program after him, not because of 475 or 3,630, but because of the longevity of that number, 3,000. And in 3,000 games for the Cardinals, Stan was never asked to leave. He was never put out of the game. He was never told to go home. He was never benched. He was never told to hit the showers early. He was never told not to come back without a note from his mom. Somebody out there knows what I'm talking about. He understood that his best ability, as is yours, is your availability. Everyone in the sound of my voice, everyone watching this video, everyone that can hear me right now, every one of you has a talent and a gift that the world should have to respect. 2,600 is also a long time. They can't respect it if you're sitting at home. They can't respect it if you've been told to sit out. Your best ability is your availability. And that's why we named this program after Stan Musial. And what does that mean to us? We're also motivated by the character and the work ethic behind those words. We also felt empowered to name our award show after Stan Musial. It's called the Musial Awards. It's held the Saturday before Thanksgiving every year in the Stiefel Theater in downtown St. Louis. We recognize the greatest acts of sportsmanship from the previous year. We recognize young people, old people like me, famous people, not so famous people. But they all have one thing in common. They've all done something extraordinary for someone else. And that's what it's all about. Having fun, being good, playing right. And this first story that we're going to see today is about a group of eighth graders who decided that standing up for a friend who was being bullied was more important than the game they were playing. That's the inspiration, the idea that we can all make a difference. Check out this story. There is one road you'll never find on a map of Kenosha, Wisconsin, Easy Street. Well, it's ordinary people doing the best they can. But ordinary people can sometimes do extraordinary things. Whatever you do, don't it. No, I want it. Scooter Terrian, Chase Vasquez, and Miles Rodriguez don't consider themselves anything special. I can't hear nothing. But their friendship is. <laughs> Some even call them the Three Musketeers. I thought you missed. You said the Three Musketeers, I said the Three Stooges. <laughs> Why are you mad? Either way, they usually hold court on the basketball court. Oh! I'm like in the guard position. So I like just having a game in my hands. Oh! In fact, Ooh. for these three teenagers, there's only one subject they like talking about more than hoops. Your defense. <laughs> and that's girls. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Mm. And from now on, there will always be one girl that will be the super glue that binds them together. Oh, cool. I don't want to work with. I know I got the rest of the stuff. Cause we're gonna do this. For 15-year-old Desiree Andrews, the world is a stage. Because she has Down syndrome, words can sometimes fail her. So she lets her music and dancing do the talking. That's why her family was thrilled when she was named to the middle school cheerleading squad. I didn't really have my hopes up that she would get that opportunity. And when she did, I was, I was just like, bursting. 
That was also a big day for three of her friends, basketball players who in their own way are Desiree's cheerleaders. Desiree is probably the happiest person I know. She's always smiling every time I see her. And those smiles must be contagious. Some gyms are named after players, others after coaches, but the gym at Lincoln Middle School became known as Dee's house. She'd get standing ovations and cheers, and you could yell her name. When the boys are playing, they're focused on basketball. But during one timeout, they started focusing on something else. Just like notice it from a distance. Off to their left, they noticed something wasn't right. Our coach called timeout, and during our timeout, uh, we noticed that people were bowling Desiree. As Dee was cheerleading, some kids were heckling. We looked at it for a while to make sure like we were like seeing it correctly. Then three boys, known better for taking shots, took a stand. They left the coach's huddle and walked over to the other side of the gym. It happened so quickly, it was like, they didn't hesitate, it was just like immediate. They were over there and making it clear that that wasn't gonna happen anymore. The kids are just looking at us like, what are they doing, why are they getting off the bench? And then we walked up to them and then we told them to stop doing that, that's not right, and they just shut up. It was merely three friends sticking up for another friend. And though it took just a moment, it's had a lasting effect. Oh, I think they're, they're heroes, I, I really do. Made me feel good, made me think that, hey, I did something right. Hopefully, this will set off a wave of other kids trying to do the same thing to protect those that, you know, she's not really able to protect herself. Is this your favorite movie? Yeah. Back in Desiree's room, plastered on the walls are posters of her favorite artists. We have Katie. Yeah. Katy Perry. Katy Perry. And who's Taylor that? Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. But there's one item she cherishes more than all the others, a gift from the players she calls her boys. She talks about them constantly. Um, they signed a basketball for her, and it's, that's her prized possession. I just wanted to let him know, as her father, how much I appreciated it. Around here, three boys with courage makes a majority. We hope that people will now know that they can take a stand. If it wasn't Desiree, if it was somebody else, I, we would have still did it because it's not right to get bullied. So the next time you're in Kenosha, don't bother looking for the three musketeers because their number is now up to four. She'll never forget it. I know none of us in my family will forget it. it we'll remember it forever. That was our first story, and we truly loved it one of our favorites. And it also dovetails into our first lesson. Depending on whether you're in school or not, sharing through online learning or connecting with family and friends, we want to make sure that we're in line with inspiring you today. So we're going to have three lessons, three lessons, six words that go with Stan Musial's number six. And the first one is have fun. And that's what you see in the video. You see, Desiree was trying to have fun and her friends understood that. Now, she may not have understood all the words of the songs, and her dance steps may have been off a little bit, but she was just trying to have fun, and her friends knew that and recognized that, and that's the biggest reason they stood up for her. That's the most important thing you should do outside of academics, and that's to have fun. Our second lesson is to be good, and we're going to park right here for a moment on be good. How many of you out there think your parents are trying to tell you to be good because you think that old people are just trying to run your life? They think that they're in charge of everything. And I'm here to tell you that just isn't true. The reason they tell you to be good is because they want other adults to treat you the way they treat you. 
You're one of the most important individuals in their lives and they don't know any other way to get other adults to treat you as special as you are. So they tell you to be good. When you're not at school and you have those days off and teachers have to come in for meetings, they talk about how good you are. They talk about your leadership. They talk about your intelligence. They talk about how you all are going to change the world and they do it all the time. How many of you have ever had this conversation with your parents? They'll say, look, I won't pick your friends for you, but this young man or this young lady over here, they don't know how to act, so they can't come to our house. How many of you have ever had that conversation with your parents? That's a tough conversation to have, but your parents never want you to be that type of young person. They don't want you to be the type of young person that no one wants to have around. That's why they always tell you to be good. And being good goes right along with our second museal moment story of the day. And it has to do with a young man who would rather lose than not have his friend in competition with him. That's the inspiration, the idea that we can all make a difference. Check out this story. In Florida, the land of sand and sunshine, some ride the waves and others make their own. Let's go, Josh! Ten-year-old Josh Zukowski is one of the top young swimmers in the country. I like it because it's a sport that you can like swim as a team and as individual. When he was just eight, he finaled in six out of seven events at the Junior Olympics. Well, at that point, he was the fastest eight-year-old in the history of the sport in South Florida. And no one is more impressed with his talent than the coach of his swim team, the Jupiter Dragons. He is a talented swimmer. However, it's not just talent. He's a hard worker, very focused swimmer. Practicing six and sometimes seven days a week, he's as present in the backyard pool as the chlorine. Because hard work always beats talent any day. Still as good as Josh is, there is one swimmer he's always looked up to. And I would be like, wow, I want to be like him when I get older. Reese Franzel is a year older than Josh. And like Josh, he's been breaking long-standing records. At eight, he was doing the Junior Olympics, so he's swimming against 10-year-olds. When Josh isn't in the pool, he likes to be on the side of it, watching Reese. When my mom said that there was this little kid named Josh Zakowski, he looks up to you like he's your, like he looks up to you like you're his hero, almost. And, I'm, and so I'm surprised that anybody would look up to me. But by the spring of 2013, instead of just looking up to Reese, he was standing next to him on the starting blocks. Thus began a very special rivalry. They would race against each other, and, and it, was, it was good. Reese would win, Josh would win. It was very competitive. Their competitive level with the two of them, they just drove each other. Then, with the season winding down, Josh showed up for one of the biggest swim meets of the year. But someone was missing. That someone was Reese. He randomly started complaining one day of uh, his hip hurting and he started limping. He had this, this fever that just would not break. Reese had been admitted to the hospital and he'd be there for the better part of the next five weeks. The diagnosis, something called osteomyelitis, an infection of the hip. Doctors tried one antibiotic after another and nothing seemed to work. He looked at me and he said, Dad, am I going to die? And I, you know, you don't expect that coming from a nine-year-old, a ten-year-old kid. And it, it, it like crushed me. Then something happened to lift his spirits. Though Reese wasn't on the starting block, he was on Josh's mind. How would you feel if you were in the hospital? Would you feel bad or would you feel good? So Josh did something few nine-year-olds would ever even think of. He dedicated his next race to Reese and went out and won yet another first place trophy. Then, a few hours later, Reese got a phone call in his hospital room that someone had dropped off a trophy at his house. 
Reese, I am so sorry that you have not been feeling well. With the trophy was a get well card signed by Josh. Months later, Reese still has it. I'd rather get second with you at the meet than win with you absent. I won this trophy for you today. I hope to see you back in the pool, your friend Josh. I, you know, as a grown man on the phone, I was, you know, choked up, tears in my eyes. I was, I, I was speechless for a little while. It was unbelievable. Reese has recovered, and the rivalry has resumed. That was awesome, honey. But it has far more meaning than it ever had before. That was great. The fact that that Josh thought of my son before he thought of himself meant a lot. It served as an example of that swimming is not everything. You know, life is bigger than swimming. I probably learn more from Josh every day than I teach him, and I couldn't be more proud. One young boy showing that kids can be as deceiving as a swimming pool. You never know how deep they really are. Gives you hope that there is still hope. <laughs>Our third lesson of the day is play right. Now, how many of you have heard something like this? Maybe you're playing outside, maybe the playground, maybe the gym, and you can't figure out who the captains are going to be, and you can't figure out whose turn it is, what the score is, and you're arguing back and forth, and somebody else takes the ball and goes home, and you just can't get it together. Finally, an adult in charge steps forward and says, hey, if you kids can't play right, you won't play at all. Somebody's heard that before. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. And this leads us to our last Museal Moment story of the day, and it has everything to do with two young ladies who decided it was the adults who weren't playing right. Adults weren't behaving in the spirit of the game, so they decided to take things upon themselves to make the sport better, to make things better for everyone. That's the inspiration, the idea that we can all make a difference. Check out this story. The toughest people don't always have the biggest muscles. 17-year-old Amaya Zafar packs a punch, but her coach never talks about her fists, only her heart. First one in the gym, last one out. She began boxing shortly after her father suggested she try the sport of fencing. She said, you're joking. I'd rather get punched in the face than have somebody poke a sword at me. Within the week, she was watching YouTube videos. They were like, this is a jab, this is a cross. And I was like, okay, you know. As a workout, boxing targets the entire body and it's two for one, cardio and strength. But after a year or so, Amaya wanted the ring and not the kind you wear on your finger. Don't ever come for me and say I can't, you know, just cause I'm a girl doesn't mean I can't fight. Women's boxing has only been out of the shadows a short time. USA Boxing, the sport's national governing body, didn't recognize female boxers until 1993, and only then after losing a landmark court case. And it wasn't until 2012 that they were allowed to competitively box at the Olympics. It's difficult for girls because they, they don't have as many chances to compete. Turns out it was hard to find female opponents in her hometown of St. Paul, Minnesota. But making matters worse, she had to absorb what her family believed was a low blow. Amaya is a devout Muslim. So to represent both modesty and identity, she wears a hijab under her headgear, as well as a shirt and leggings under her shorts and top. It's saying this is who I am, that the way I conduct myself in life is based on these beliefs, and I'm proud of that. But USA Boxing deemed it a violation of uniform regulations. So Amaya was kept out of competitions. What she needed was someone in her corner. And though she didn't know it then, that person was 1,500 miles away. Ask her family and you get the impression that they never treated 16-year-old Aaliyah Charbonnier with kid gloves, but they never expected her to wear boxing gloves. It was never intended for her to be a boxer, so. But this self-described girly girl didn't find the same kind of passion for sports like volleyball and cheerleading. 
I like sweating and I like, like hard work. I didn't want to depend on my team whether I won or lost. Finding opponents in Orlando, Florida wasn't any easier than St. Paul, Minnesota. But like Amaya, Aaliyah was earning the respect of her male gym mates. Trains very hard and um, she's always asking questions. How did I do? The road for both boxers was uphill and paved with sweat. And it eventually led to an intersection in Kissimmee, Florida. The Sugarbird Tournament is a boxing competition featuring what they call talent of the future. Aaliyah and Amaya signed up and were on the card to fight one another. Amaya's coaches were led to believe that this time she'd get a chance to compete. But just minutes before her fight, she took yet another punch to her gut. The judges again ruled that Amaya was in violation of uniform regulations. She comes out and sits next to me. And so like, I'm kind of tearing up because I felt for her. Since it was a forfeit, Aaliyah was awarded a championship belt, but she didn't feel much like a champion. We didn't feel like she had earned that, you know, because they never fought. And at the same time, we kind of felt bad for Amaya's situation. She may not have felt like a champion, but what she did next made her one. She walked over to Amaya and handed her the belt. Like, what are you doing? Like, that's yours. Like, don't give me that. She was like, no, it's yours. Like, take it. And I was just like, like, what? <laughs> They didn't even give her a chance to get the boat. So I was like, let me give her the boat for like, at least showing up and trying. It's a very lonely experience to be striving for something that is so important to you. And for Aliyah to reach out and give this to her was such a valuable act of solidarity that saying you're not alone, I see you, I hear you and I stand with you. And the people at that tournament were not the only ones to see. Even though Amaya and Aaliyah never got in the ring that day, they both won the much bigger fight. In April, Amaya became the first boxer to wear a hijab in a sanctioned event after USA Boxing lifted its ban on the apparel. For now, it's just for local events but it's a start. When they said I could fight, I was like, we did it. Like, her giving me the belt is really what showed USA Boxing, like, look, this isn't right, you know? And so I really do, like, appreciate her giving, because that was, it was like a big, it was like a statement. It made me feel, like, like proud of what happened and everything, and how a little, like, gesture made, like, a big difference. Not many can say they were the first, but now Amaya can. It was a two-fisted approach to change, giving a whole new meaning to the phrase, fight like a girl. That was an awesome story. Aaliyah and Amaya had what it took to play right and to be able to change the rules within their sport. And that brings us to the close of today's program. We had three lessons today, three important lessons that will carry you through today and throughout life. Number one, the most important thing in sports is to have fun. The second thing is be good. The third is play right. I know you probably have already heard it from me too many times, but have fun, be good, play right. Those are very important lessons. Three lessons, six words that go along with Stan Musial's number six. As we close today, I want to tell each and every one of you that as these times are tough, you are tougher. Your families are tougher. The bonds you hold together are tougher than any situation you would ever go through. I want you to hold on to each other. I want you to care about each other. And most importantly, I want you to be good to each other. We would be inspired if you would take a moment to develop and create your own Musial moment. Share it with us. 
Let us know the effect it had on your life. We have come across hundreds of stories of young people just like yourselves that have made an impact on others that is immeasurable. This is truly the opportunity to change actions that truly benefit others. That's why we're so dedicated to the mission. We want you to excel and shine in the moment. You can find our contact information online at sportsmanship.org. Again, that's sportsmanship.org. My name is Solomon Alexander. It has been my pleasure today to be your host for Museal Moments. I would also like to thank my producer and daughter, Madison Alexander, for doing such a great job on this. And please invite your friends back to our Facebook page. Check us out online, talk us up. Sincerely, it's all about you. But our commitment to the St. Louis area and finding the best sportsmanship across the country is what makes this happen. And it starts right here. I'm Solomon Alexander. Thank you so much, and please be good to each other. Thanks for hanging out. We've thrown a lot at you. There's some cool follow-up material we'd like you all to check out. Visit sportsmanship.org. There's some additional information and some links to some thoughtful material. At the St. Louis Sports Commission, we're committed to the idea of resources that allow you to be the best you can be. We're all about growing this community for outstanding results today, tomorrow, and for the years ahead. So go out and make a difference. Be the best you can be.